This is the Jewish journey to New York City, illustrated by the experiences of my family, the Miller family. Uh, that's actually not super accurate. It's really more like the Miller, Ruben, Weiss, Semmel, Cypher, Adler, Finkelstein family. Um, but before I introduce you to all of these people, I want to throw out a quick disclaimer that I am not an expert. I am not a genealogist. I am not a historian. I'm not an anthropologist. I am not a research expert of any kind. I am just a gal with an ancestry.com account and strong Google skills and insatiable curiosity. Um, and that last quality is really just as important as the prior two, um, because when doing genealogical research for Jews of Eastern European origin, which many of us are, um, it's often kind of like solving a mystery. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why that is the case. Um, some of them are more obvious, of course, the systematic destruction of our ancestors' records during World War II, but a lot of the other reasons are less obvious and more complex, um, and we're obviously going to get into some of those tonight, um, but it is very important to understand them because they provide the context you need to put the clues together. Um, often just reading the historical documents isn't enough. You need context to understand what it is you're looking at. Um, and I think primarily um, for us to discuss tonight is the fact that this hunt is made more difficult by uh, the nature of borders in Europe, uh, really throughout the 20th century and all of history prior to that. Um, for us, it's going to be relevant primarily to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, borders were not exactly a hard and fast thing in Europe for a long time. Europe was basically constantly at war up through the end of World War II. Wars are generally about territory. So of course, territorial borders were shifting constantly. They were very malleable. Um, and so this could impact a lot of aspects of your research and of your ancestors' records. It could impact how your relative might have identified their um, citizenship or nationality, um, where they might have said they were from, where they might have told the U.S. government they were from, where the U.S. government might have thought they were from. Those three things might be different for the same person in some cases. Um, it would also impact how your ancestor self-identified where they felt they were from versus where their piece of paper happened to say they were from. And of course, it would impact what languages they spoke and what languages they could read and write. And um, perhaps most relevantly, it would impact the language that their historical documents are in. Um, and at least for my family um, and in my research, the best example of how this uh, phenomenon can impact your genealogical research uh, is Poland. Um, and I included this Jeopardy clue because I thought it was funny and I happened to see it while I was working on ancestry research. Um, but I think it's also maybe a little bit misleading because it only illustrates um, a few of the times that Polish territory changed hands. Um, but as you can see in this animation, uh, it was way more than a few times. Um, actually, the territorial evolution of Poland has its own entire Wikipedia page because it is a long and complicated story. Um, the place that we now know as Poland changed borders and sovereignty many times in its history. Um, the Polish ethnic state is actually very old. I think it dates back to the middle-ish of the first millennium. Um, but the Polish nation state has faced considerable challenges to its sovereignty starting in, I want to say the mid to late 16th -ish century, don't quote me on that. Um, but so it really depends on where in Poland your ancestor lived and also when in Poland your ancestor lived. Um, they might have identified or been identified as Polish, as German or Prussian, as Russian, um, perhaps as Austrian, um, or none of the above. And what do I mean by none of the above? I am referring to the various historical regions in Europe that um, Ashkenazi Jews may have hailed from. Um, this is a big one, both in terms of geographic area and relevance to this presentation. Um, this is Galicia. Many of us have relatives that hailed from this region. I certainly do. Um, and the reason these historical regions matter in your genealogical research is that they're constant. Galicia has been around for hundreds of years. Regardless of the various nation states that and empires that have risen and fallen around it and 
within it, Galicia has always been there. And so the Jews that come from these regions would have been more likely to self-identify as from this region to say they are Galicianer than they are to say that they were Polish or Austrian or whoever happened to be in charge of where they lived at that time. Um, and immediately to the southeast of Galicia is another very important historical region for American Ashkenazi Jews, Bukovina. I have relatives who come from this region. Um, and so you can see where they are in the scope of Europe. Um, here's both of them on a map together. This is Galicia here, and then this is Bukovina here. And for anyone who's curious, um, another major area that had a lot of an our ancestors in it, the Pale of Settlement, is sort of here-ish. And it bordered Galicia, so they were neighbors. But just to be clear, Galicia and Bukovina were not in the Pale of Settlement. They were never part of the Russian Empire. Um, so to illustrate in a sort of real and personal way how this kind of confusion of Poland's track record, um, the kind of confusion it can create in your research, I am going to use a case study of my great grandma, Grace Rubin. Um, and if you are wondering why a Polish Jewish immigrant born at the turn of the 20th century was named Grace of all things, that's a great question. And don't worry, we will be answering it later. Um, Grace is my mother's father's mother, and no, you do not have to remember that, there will not be a quiz, um, but I'm actually going to be touching on quite a few of my relatives in this presentation, so here is a quick look at my family tree to help you follow along, don't worry, I'll be showing it to you again later, and Grace is in the upper left, and there she is, my mother's father's mother. Um, so. Grace is going to help us demonstrate the first bullet point on this list of all of the obstacles that we're going to be addressing tonight that you might run into when researching your family. And that first one is confusing records and conflicting evidence. That is to say, pieces of information that don't make sense in conjunction with each other or sometimes might not even make sense on their own. Um, then we're going to talk about poor OCR quality, which is to say difficulties with converting old images to text. Um, and then we will talk about transliteration of both place names and people names and how to get started when you know little to nothing about your ancestors or when they got here. And then finally, we're going to talk about the phenomenon of missing naturalization records, particularly for female relatives. So jumping right in here, what was confusing about Grace's records? Well, frankly, what wasn't? Um, but in this case, we are going to be starting with this document, which is the affidavit for license to marry that Grace and her husband Izzy filed here in New York City on the day that they were married. And marriage records, um, especially if your family got married in uh, the United States, are great sources of information. And for now, I specifically want to draw your attention to the portion in Grace's column on the right here that talks about her place of birth and her parents' places of birth. Um, so if we start with Grace here on the place of birth line, we can see that someone wrote in Poland and then scratched it out and then wrote Austria and then tried to squish in Galicia over to the left there. And then for her father's country of birth, someone wrote Galicia and then wrote Poland and then scratched that out and then tried to squish Austria all the way over to the left. And then finally for her mother's country of birth, someone wrote Galicia and then squished in Austria over to the left and Poland is nowhere to be found. So what the heck does this mean and which of these is actually correct? Well, answering that question really highlights the importance of understanding the geopolitical realities of Europe in our ancestors' time. Um, and I don't want to bore you with a whole long history lesson, so I am going to try to do a really quick crash course in Galician sovereignty here. So a quick timeline, World War I ended in November 1918, and we care about that because that is when the Austrian Empire collapsed, basically. And the Polish people lost no time uh, at the end of the war and immediately started forming the Second Polish Republic, starting to reestablish a Polish state and to reclaim their territory. And they went to war with the Russians in February of 1919 to achieve those ends, to try to reclaim Polish territory that had been seized by the Russian Empire. And then in June 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, which of course is the treaty that officially ended hostilities of World War I. The reason we care about the Treaty of Versailles is that in addition to ending World War I, it also formally acknowledged the establishment of this new Polish Republic. So for the first time, all of these international governments were agreeing, yes, this new Polish state is valid, it's independent and sovereign, we recognize it. But that's kind of all it said. Uh, it basically said, yeah, sure, Poland is a thing, but we're not gonna say where it is. Um, it 
acknowledged this new Polish state, but didn't acknowledge its borders. They weren't delineated. In particular, the eastern border of Poland was not delineated. And if you remember, we care about the eastern border of Poland because that's where Galicia is. So finally, in March of 1921, the Polish-Soviet War was ended by the Treaty of Riga, also known as the Peace of Riga. And we care about this because the terms of the treaty dictated that Polish Galicia would be ceded to the new Polish state. Whew, okay, so now that we know all that, I want to point out that this treaty was signed in March of 1921. And if we go back to Grace and Izzy's marriage paperwork and we look at the date in the bottom left here, we can see that they were married in May of 1923, particularly May 12th, 1923. Okay, well, if the treaty was signed over two years prior to this, why is there so much confusion in Grace's paperwork? And the answer is, even though Poland and Russia, or I suppose the Soviet Union, signed this treaty in March of 1921, it wasn't immediately recognized by other international governments. And in fact, particularly the portion of the treaty that ceded Polish Galicia to this new Polish state, generally wasn't acknowledged by other international governments until May 15th, 1923, three whole days after Grace and Izzy were married. So with this context, I can now understand why an American clerk wouldn't really know what to put for a person who was born in the Polish section of Galicia at the time that it was Austria. Uh, it makes sense. I didn't know any of this prior to doing my genealogical research. I had no idea about any of this. And until I did the, re the uh, historical research and learned all of this, I would never have been able to make sense of that record, but now I can. So moving along to the next obstacle you might face in your research, um, I am going to talk about OCR for a moment. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, and it's basically a software program that reads images of text sources and converts them into a format that a search engine can recognize as a text document. And that's important because we want to be able to look up these records online. We want to be able to search for them. And it's important to note that each website you use in your research, each database you use, basically has access to the exact same images. They are all basically looking at the same digital copies of the original microfiche images of the original historical documents, your ship manifests and what have you. However, even though they're all looking at the same images, each website does its own OCR and your results may vary. Um, so this leads into probably, I'm going to say the second best tip I can give you for your genealogical research, which is to say, always check multiple sources whenever you can. Even if you're looking at the exact same images, um, these databases may have OCR'd them differently. And so the more you can corroborate or the more you can catch errors, the better. And to demonstrate the kind of OCR issues you can run into, I am going to show you an immigration record for my great, great grandfather, Louis. And so this is my mom's mom's dad's dad, for those of you following along at home. And this is the immigration manifest, the ship manifest that was created on the day that he arrived in New York. And I think it is so cool that I can see this. Um, and we are going to be looking at two pieces of information in particular from this manifest. So first, we're going to be looking at his name. Simple enough. We have family name and given name. And when we scroll down to his line on this manifest, we get this super helpful line of chicken scratch. But once I did interpret this, it actually turned out to be very helpful because it confirmed for me that he immigrated under his birth name, Lizer, which is the Germanic form of the Hebrew name Eliezer. And in the Ellis Island databases OCR, we get a written record of this as Lizer. Great. That's what we're expecting to see. But in Ancestry.com's OCR, we get Sizer. Not exactly. So this leads me to my next tip which is to always broaden your searches. Because if I had only been looking for Lizer exactly and not anything that looked or sounded like Lizer, I would not have found this record. And continuing on down this manifest, we come to the column that describes Lewis's last permanent residence. And there's two columns, one for country and one for city. And the handwriting's a little hard to make out, so I've typed it up for you. The country is Austria, the Austrian Empire at that time, and the city is called Hodehov. Um, which is um, at, was at the time a large Jewish population center, and it's located in Galicia. So 
Let's see how the OCR handled this. In the Ellis Island databases, we find Hodohov, Austria. Great, exactly what we're expecting to see. On Ancestry.com, we get Chaudhry. So again, be flexible and think creatively when you're searching and be prepared to click on anything that looks like it might be your people because you never know when you're going to run into some pretty ridiculous OCR errors. So this is actually a great example also of the next issue we're going to be talking about, which is transliteration. And uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar, transliteration basically refers to the process of using one alphabet to write down a word that originated in a different alphabet, which I think would very obviously create problems. Um, and when researching um, our ancestors, you run into two primary issues with this. Um, and the first one is that these American clerks were basically just, uh, they were just doing their best. They were trying to either understand your ancestor's accent or try to read your ancestor's handwriting or trying to decipher um, some kind of official document, a passport or what have you from the old country written in a language this clerk doesn't speak so that they could then try to write down the name of a place they've never heard of before. Understandably, they made mistakes. And then even if you can figure out what place name this clerk was trying to write down, you face an additional hurdle because that place name probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, and this is due to the uh, geopolitical confusion we addressed earlier. Um, a lot of place names have changed since then. And I'll show you some examples of common ones you might find in your research. So today, what we consider or what we know as Bialystok Poland, in my ancestors paperwork, it's listed as Bialstok, Russia. This one's pretty straightforward. You see Bialstok, you generally know what it's talking about, but it's notable that it is in Russia, not Poland. And the next example is Hodhiv, Ukraine, and I probably butchered that pronunciation. Back then was Hodhov in the Austrian Empire. And it's worth noting that those sound very similar when I say them out loud, but to an American eye, I think in writing, they don't look the same at all. And then Excuse me, the final example I have here is um, Chernivtsi, which today is in Ukraine. Back then was Chernovitz in the Austrian Empire. And this was also a huge um, Jewish population center. And this one was located in Bukovina, in northern Bukovina. Um, and so those are place names you might run into transliteration errors with. To demonstrate the kind of transliteration problems you can run into with the names of people, we will be using my great great grandma Yetta as an example. So this is my dad's mom's dad's mom. Um, and I have to admit that I chose Yetta on purpose for comic effect because Yetta's full married name was Yetta Finkelstein. So Join me now on a journey through the years as we find out what American census takers thought Yetta's name was. So in the 1910 US Census, we have Eddie Finkelstein. In the 1915 state census, we have Annie Finkelstein. And in the 1920 US Census, we have, oh, so close, it's Yetta Finkelstein with an I before the L. And then in the 1925 New York State Census, we have Nettie Finkelstein. And then for quite literally the first time in history in 1930, they actually got her name right in the census. And then in 1940, it's mostly right, but they put the I before the E. However, I do think it's worth pointing out that the handwriting of this particular census taker in 1940 was so poor that Ancestry.com's OCR record for this line of this census page is Yetta Funkalighty. Literally, that's what it says in Ancestry.com's database, Yetta Funkalighty. So again, this really highlights the point that you have to think creatively and be prepared to click on anything that looks like it might be your people. Because if I had not been prepared to click on Yetta Funkalighty, I would not have this record for her. So then the question becomes, well, if their names could be spelled so wrong, how do you know it's actually your family member? In the case of census records, for me, the best way to check is to look at who else was living with them at that time, especially if it's an ancestor who had children. And in Yetta's case, I know that she had three children and I know their names and ages. And in census records, the kids will always be listed in birth order from oldest to youngest. So in both of these census records, even though Yetta's name is spelled wrong, 
she has three kids listed here in birth order, Lily, Isidore, and Meyer, and the likelihood of there being another Yetta Finkelstein in Brooklyn with three children with those three names born in this order, um, probably very slim. So even though her name is spelled wrong, I can be very sure that this is my Yetta Finkelstein. So that's all well and good, but how do you get started if you don't even know when your ancestor got here, if you don't know which records to check because you don't know when they were here? So searching for an immigration record when you don't have some idea of a date range can be daunting, especially if your relative had a fairly common name, like good luck finding a Sarah Cohen in Ellis Island records without being able to narrow it down by year. So there are two ways to find your when. You can either go through census records and work backwards, or you can check naturalization paperwork, and I'll show you how to do both. And in the case of census records, you want to check both the national and state census records. Of course, the U.S. Census is every 10 years, but through 1925, New York State actually conducted its own census in the intervening five years, which is fantastic because for those of us who have relatives who arrived here in the first two decades of the 20th century, this is an excellent additional source of information. Um, and to show you how to figure out your ancestors' year of immigration using census records, we are going to use my great grandma Annie as an example. This is my dad's dad's mom. Um, and here she is on the 1915 New York State Census. Annie Zypher was her maiden name. And there she is, the second row from the bottom. And we care about these columns here under the citizenship heading. And it's important to note that when you look at state and um, national census records, they actually went about recording this differently. So in the New York State Census, the question here is number of years in the United States. They asked immigrants, how long have you been here? And in Annie's case, she said two years. So we do the math, 1915 minus two gets us an immigration year of 1913. And if we go to the next census, the 1920 US census, we can see that Annie, who is now Annie Miller because she has married, um, said on the US census, which asks for the actual year of immigration, not how long you've been here, Annie said 1913, which is great because this is now consistent across multiple records. And if you check multiple census records for your uh, relative or ancestor and that year of immigration stays constant or at least relatively constant within a couple of years across multiple census records, you can have greater confidence that that was actually their year of immigration. And Annie was spot on in this case. She actually did immigrate in 1913 and I was able to find her immigration record because of this. Now, if you have naturalization paperwork for your ancestor, you can save yourself some time and some math by checking that directly. And this is the petition for naturalization of my great grandpa, Izzy, who is married to Grace, whom you met earlier. Um, and the uh, amount of information you can get from naturalization forms is fantastic. And it's very specific. So in Izzy's case, we have all of this wonderful information. We can see what city he emigrated from, Hamburg, the day he left Hamburg, the day he arrived in New York, and even the name of the ship he got here on. So that saves you a lot of time to look at this directly if the information is correct and that can be a big if because immigration or sorry naturalization paperwork was often filed many years after the immigration took place izzy got here in 1910 but this paperwork wasn't filed until 15 years later in 1925 so it would have been understandable if he'd fudged a couple of the details now i got lucky izzy was a very reliable narrator all of this was correct and i was able to find his ship manifest by using these dates and ship names um but if you are not sure whether your ancestor had all the details right on their paperwork, or you try to search using these details and you can't find any matching records, try using census records to corroborate it because they may have misremembered when they arrived. And the last obstacle that I want to address um, is, surprise, women's suffrage. So the 19th Amendment, which extended the right to vote to white women, was passed in 1919 and adopted in 1920. And if you find yourself wondering why I am talking about constitutional amendments in a presentation about genealogy, this is why. Because at the time that the 19th Amendment was passed, women only had their own citizenship if they were unmarried. As soon as they married, they lost their own citizenship and their citizenship status was whatever their husband's status was. Um, and this was done retroactively and without notice. So thousands of American women lost their citizenship overnight just because they were married to um, non-citizens. 
Um, so this is problematic for a lot of reasons and frustrating for a lot of reasons, um, but I don't want to get into all of the legal complexities. What you need to know is that the Cable Act fixed this in September 1922. Women could have their own citizenship. Um, and this matters for genealogical research because if you can't find naturalization paperwork for a woman ancestor, this is probably why. Figure out when she naturalized. If it was prior to 1922, she never filed her own paperwork because she naturalized automatically when her husband did. As soon as he filed his naturalization paperwork and was approved, it automatically extended to her. And that's, I mean, from the perspective of a woman living in the 21st century, frustrating for a lot of reasons. But as a genealogical researcher, it is particularly frustrating. And to demonstrate why that is, we are going to meet my great, great grandmother, Tilly. Um, so for anybody who had dad's mom's mom's mom on their bingo card, you now get a point. Um, and we are going to look here at the petition for naturalization of Tilly's husband, Abraham. And this is chock full of great information about Abe. This is how I know Abe's date of birth, where he was born, when he arrived in the US, all of this fantastic stuff. Because this was filed in 1911, this also counts as Tilly's petition for naturalization. And here's what we find out about her from it. We get her married name and the fact that she was born in Russia, which doesn't actually tell you anything because all that means is that the place she was born was somewhere in the massive Russian empire at the time of her birth. This is not helpful. This doesn't have her maiden name. Good luck trying to find an immigration record based on this. So how do you overcome this? Well, a great alternative source of information is marriage records. As you saw earlier in the case of Grace and Izzy, you can find fantastic information in marriage records. Grace's maiden name was there, where, well, nominally where she came from, etc. I have not been able to find full marriage records for Abe and Tilly. Um, I've only been able to find a listing for them in a marriage index, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an index at the end of a bunch of uh, marriage ledgers. Um, and basically it allows you to look up the name of a bride or groom and just to see the name of the person they married and the date of the marriage. And that's all you get. Um, so the good news is I was able to find Abe and Tilly in a marriage index. And the great news is um, that means I was able to find out Tilly's maiden name. And the terrible news is her maiden name was Strzelecki. And if you're not clear on why that's terrible news, I will direct you to the earlier portion of this presentation when I discuss transliteration of Jewish surnames. So based on this information, I basically gave up hope finding out more information about Tilly because I don't even know if this is what her actual surname was. This is what one clerk thought her surname was. Who knows what Tilly thought it was or how it was actually pronounced. Um, this is based without more information. This is basically impossible um, to use as um, a method for finding out when she got here. So I didn't think I would ever find any information to that end. So you can imagine my surprise when one day I logged into Ancestry.com and it said that it had found a potential immigration record for Tilly. And you can imagine my excitement when I clicked on it and then imagine how I felt when I opened it and it looked like this. So I will never be able to know for sure, I think whether this actually is Tilly's immigration record because of the damage. And of course her record is one of the lines here at the bottom. So there's a lot missing. Um, but there's a couple of breadcrumbs here that make me feel like this is worth keeping around um, and I'll show you why. So I can't actually read the, the first name is missing in this record and I can't actually read the surname, but the ancestry.com OCR says Strelecki and the Ellis Island OCR says Strebecki. Now these are not Streletsky, but they're close enough. I mean, there's no Funkalite happening here. We're, we're in the same ballpark. So that's close enough to be worth considering. Um, and the record for this person is a single female traveler um, who is the same age as Tilly would have been in this year. So those are points in the plus column. And then we also look at these two columns here, which of course you can't see, but this one is for nationality, which says Russian, great, that matches what I know. And then this column here is called race or people. And for Jewish immigrants, this would typically say Hebrew or sometimes Yiddish. But in this case, it says Lithuanian. And that would be very uncommon for a Jewish immigrant, but I am not going to discount this record because of that, and I'll tell you why. If we go back to Abe's naturalization paperwork and check where he was born, it says, Bialstok, Russia. 
what we would now think of as Bialystok Poland. So then the question becomes, would Abe have considered himself Russian or Polish? And I actually think the answer is neither. I think Abe would have self-identified as Litvak. So um, the geographical distribution of Litvak Jews has really nothing to do with the borders of the modern nation state of Lithuania. Um, you can define it one of two ways, either linguistically, because Litvak Jews actually had their own dialect of Yiddish, or you can define it culturally, which communities um, were culturally aligned with Litvak Jews. Um, and if we look in the bottom left of this map, we can see that by either definition, Bialystok falls within the boundaries of Jewish Lithuania. And so I think that Abe would most likely have identified as a Litvak Jew. And Jews of a feather tended to flock together, Galicianers married Galicianers and so forth. Um, so to me, if Abe was a, a Litvak Jew, it makes perfect sense that Tilly would have been as well. And so for that reason, I have kept that shit manifest around, even though I can't at all be certain that it is her. So to wrap up, I think all of this leads me to the best, the single best tip I can possibly give you in your genealogical research, which is to read absolutely everything. Read every line on every record that you can find because you never know what will turn up new information that you didn't have before. And to show you what I mean, we're going to start by looking at my great grandpa, Paul, um, my father's father's father. I don't have a picture of him like I did for Grace, um, but I assume you can just use my face um, because I look exactly like my dad who looks exactly like his dad. So I assume we all look like Paul. Um, and Paul is the husband of Annie whom you met earlier. And here is Paul's World War I draft registration card, which is very cool. This is the only one I have for anyone in my family. Um, and I was able to confirm that this was his by looking at name, date of birth, his address, great, confirmed. But then I kept reading down the page because again, you never know what you'll find. And this line here asks about dependents. Basically, could you possibly qualify for a draft exemption because you have people who are solely dependent on you to survive? And we see wife in this line, which I expected because he and Annie were married by this point, but we also see mother. Now, I don't know if this actually refers to Paul's mother or to Annie's mother, his mother-in-law. I can't know. But either way, this is the only record I have that indicates that either of their mothers was living with them. In the case of Annie's mother, I knew that she'd been in the U.S. for a long time by this point, but I have no record of her ever living with Paul and Annie. She doesn't show up on any of their census records. And if this is Paul's mother, which I think is highly unlikely, but if it is, this is the only record I have that she was ever in the United States. I have no immigration immigration records for her. I have nothing else, which is why I don't think it was her. I think it was more likely his mother-in-law. But even so, this is still a breadcrumb that I didn't have before. And then finally, we're going to go back to Grace and Izzy's marriage paperwork. Um, and again, these are my mother's father's parents. And specifically, we're going to look at Izzy. And this is their certificate of marriage from the city of New York. Um, and these are great because they list the father and mother's names for both the bride and the groom. And in Izzy's case, we can see that his father's first name is listed as Philip. Now, I always thought that was a little suspect that a Romanian Jew born in the 1800s would have been named Philip. I assumed this was anglicized. But until recently, I didn't have any other name to give him. I didn't have any uh, evidence of any other name until I went and found Izzy's ship manifest from the day that he arrived in New York. And in particular, here we're interested in this column that says the name and complete address of nearest relative or friend in country whence alien came. Um, and if we scroll down to Izzy's line, we see that his answer is father, Fievel Rubin. Fievel, that makes so much more sense than Philip. And I never would have known this if I had not read every line on this page. And similarly, we are now going to come full circle and answer the first question I posed in this presentation, which is why was my Galician Jewish great grandma, who was born in 1900, named Grace? Well, of course she wasn't. And by scrutinizing her naturalization paperwork, I was able to find that she immigrated under her birth name, which is this fantastic Yiddish name, Chesel. Again, this makes so much more sense. And so this family tree that I have been showing you throughout the evening has a lot of suspiciously Anglo names on it. But if we update it with the names I just showed you and the other ones that I've gleaned throughout my research, it looks more like this. 
which I think makes a little more sense. And I'm going to leave this up for um, my family members who are on the call this evening to look at in case they would like to check out these names while I sort of wrap up here. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is um, a sort of modern personalized interpretation of the Jewish journey, not so much to New York, but in New York. A cool thing that you can do with all of this information once you have it. So I have carefully collated the addresses from every record I have for each member of, or each branch of my family, basically. Um, census records, naturalization paperwork, draft cards, what have you. And I have checked each of those uh, addresses against the city buildings database to check which of those buildings are still standing. And by doing that, I was able to create this map. It is a listing of every building my answers lived in in New York City between 1905 and 1940. And it's color coded by maternal and paternal sides of the family. And these icons on here are either X's or check marks to indicate which of these buildings are still there, which of these buildings I can go look at and like exist in front of that my family lived in. And so I can't retrace my ancestors' journeys across the Atlantic. And frankly, I am not all that interested in spending four to seven days in third class passage in a steamship. Um, but I can retrace their steps here in the city and really turn their Jewish journey into a journey of my own.